Welcome to Oncology Radio. We are bringing you the latest information in the arena of oncology. Every episode brings you a new Maryland Oncology Hematology Physician host, along with special guests in cancer research, new trials, cancer treatment, nonprofits, and cancer care. Maryland Oncology Hematology is broadcasting Oncology Radio from one of our 14 locations throughout Maryland. You can find Oncology Radio on Spreaker, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. So stay tuned and welcome to Oncology Radio. Welcome to another episode, the latest episode of Oncology Radio. My name is Dr. Colette Magnet, and I'm a breast surgeon doing breast cancer surgery. I'm lucky enough this evening, fortunate enough to have Dr. Kathy Huang, H-U-A-N-G, with me, uh, who uh, is a reconstructive plastic surgeon who has been working with me, that is, we've been working together for approximately the past, I don't know, what is it, Kathy, 15 years? Thereabouts, you're making me feel very, very old. Of course I am. That's, that's my plan. <laughs> and in return, you're supposed to make me feel very, very young. So that'll be great. Well, there are things that I can do in my office about that. <laughs> that's great. So, um, so what, what we thought we would do tonight that is talk about the, um, the team approach to breast cancer surgery Uh, which Kathy and I have been doing for the past 15 years and have made a lot of progress over the years. Uh, So we'd like to share what we've learned. We thought first, um, Kathy would interview me and I would interview her about um, about who we are so that we wouldn't feel shy about saying what we've done. So Kathy, you're gonna interview me first. Absolutely, Dr. Magnet. So you are new to Maryland Oncology Hematology. Why don't you tell all the listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. So basically, I've been out in practice of breast surgery for 35 years after residency. Uh, I was at um, George, I graduated from Georgetown program, the surgery program in 1986 after graduating from medical school in 1981. And uh, so I've been, I initially did general surgery and then specialized in breast cancer surgery. So I've only done breast cancer surgery for the past 26 years. The, uh, I was on the faculty at Georgetown and then I went out into private practice and started the breast cancer center at Sibley Memorial Hospital, which is now part of Johns Hopkins. So basically my whole career has been about taking care of breast cancer patients and developing programs to help them in a multidisciplinary fashion. So what I mean by multidisciplinary fashion is we wanna work together with all the specialists, that's the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, the rehab people, the, uh, the breast imagers, so that we can help the patient decide what is the best option for them in terms of their breast cancer treatment. That's what I've been doing. And I've been lucky enough to find Dr. Huang. What I did was uh, when she started practice, she's very smart. So when she started practice, she changed her operative days to my operative days and her office hours days to my office hour days so that we could work together. And we've had a very good relationship and have taken care of many patients since then together. So Kathy, that, me sound, that sounds me, that makes me sound so very intentional. It kind of fell into it a little bit less planned than that, but it actually has worked out very well for both of us that to be able to see patients on the same days and operate on the same days in order to coordinate care. Correct. I thought it made you sound more brilliant than anything. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, so Sounds tell me devious. A, I know. Well, if the shoe fit where if the shoe fits wear it. So oh. <laughs> why don't you tell me a little bit about you? Sure. I've been in practice now for about 15 years. It'll be 15 come August. And 
I originally trained, um, I did both medical school as well as my plastic surgery training at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I followed that with a year of breast and microsurgery fellowship with Bernie Chang up in Baltimore at Mercy Medical Center. I started off in practice here um, in 2005 uh, in a group that also focused on breast reconstruction. And what I brought to the practice was um, a technique which was new at the time, but is not new really anymore, which is microsurgery for breast reconstruction, utilizing the skin and fat from the lower abdomen to make a breast without having to sacrifice the muscle. That's great. Because the thing about it is, is that before that we would take, I'm old enough to remember when we did sacrifice the muscle and the patients couldn't do sit-ups, couldn't do several things that they would have liked to do. Uh, they, they didn't really need to do sit-ups because their belly was nice and flat, but that's not the only reason for sit-ups, of course. And so they, uh, so I, I saw a lot of progress over the years. Um, and that's great that you came to that practice, I think. Uh, and we've done a lot of, of the, uh, we've, we've done a lot of flaps in the beginning, but why don't you tell us, and by that, I mean the audience, um, a little bit more about um, the different types of breast reconstruction. Certainly. I think that even whenever I see a patient, we talk about breast reconstruction, basically having a series of forks in the road. The first fork really comes down to using your own tissue versus using implants. And you know, you mentioned that in the beginning, I do have to let the audience know that I, what we're talking about by using your own tissues is, is using your own lower abdominal tissue. And without using sacrifice in the muscle, that's called a deep flap, D-E-I-P, for, standing for deep inferior epigastric perforator flap. And it is actually a great, great surgery that I did probably for the first 12 years. I started out doing alone. I started, then I worked with a partner that I had in practice, and I, but I really haven't done it in the past three years. And the main reason for that is because my partner left the practice. And I think that there, it really is something that is better off with having two people do the same way that you and I work together for breast reconstruction, having two people who know each other's every move, next move makes for a far more seamless operation than two strangers working together or even just one doctor doing it alone. So that's why I've stopped doing the uh, deep flaps. Um, I've already forgotten what you've asked me though. <laughs> so you were gonna, so we're oh. gonna talk about different types of reconstruction, but about the deep flaps, there are practices that, um, uh, reconstructive practice, practices that we have do deep flaps. And it's best if it's two people in one practice that can work together because it's, it's just, like you said, it's just more seamless. It's better for the patient and it doesn't take as long to do the surgery as well, generally Absolutely. speaking. Absolutely. Absolutely. I definitely always evaluate a patient and I can talk to them still about doing deep flaps. And if that is the best option for them, I'll tell them, you know, I'm not beyond telling a patient what is their best option, even if I don't do it. And I don't have any problem giving out names of other practices that have teams of people who work together all the time to do this, do the free flaps. Um, I remember where I was and we were talking about the other option, which is implants. Um, I do most, I do pretty much hundred percent implant-based reconstruction at this point. And implant-based reconstruction has changed tremendously since I was a medical student, then a resident, and then a fellow, and even now, because the two main things that have changed is the type of implants available, as well as where we're placing the implants. Right. And, and the thing is, is that a lot of people worry about implants, uh, but let me talk first about the surgery, the, the real surgery, the cancer part of the surgery, uh, and not the reconstruction. I'm joking. The reconstruction is very, very important. But let me just talk first about what, how we've changed in the 35 years I've been in practice, how we've changed the reconstruction of patients. You know, we used to do we used to not do reconstruction. So 35 years ago, we didn't do reconstruction at the same time. We would do the mastectomy, close it. It would be flat, put a prosthesis in there, in the bra, and then possibly do a reconstruction later because we thought that the reconstruction would mask a recurrence. But then it was proven basically through several studies that that's not true. So the second thing we started doing was doing 
uh, reconstruction at the same time as the surgery. So that was good, better for the patient, one operation or two operations, depending. And then the third thing we did was we started saying, well, maybe we can keep the skin, more of the skin of the breast and do what we call skin sparing mastectomies, where we just take out the nipple or real complex and leave everything else there, the, all the skin there. So then we said, well, maybe, and by we, I mean the breast cancer surgical community said, well, maybe we could do nipple sparing mastectomies. Uh, and the first nipple sparing mastectomy I did was, was several years ago because there was a very avant-garde plastic surgeon that I worked with who was at, at Georgetown at the time. But now we, nipple sparing mastectomy is really the standard of care in many, many patients, specifically if the cancer isn't under the nipple or too close to the nipple or something like that. And it just gives such a much better look long-term. Patients are just much happier. Uh, so, so that's kind of how we've gone with, with prepping, with, with doing different types of mastectomies over the past 35 years. So then enter the plastic surgery community who started out just doing, doing implant reconstructions, then went on to autologous, uh, the, the patient's own tissue, and then now have started doing implant reconstructions in a different way that makes it easier for the patient in terms of pain and everything else. So Kathy, can you tell me, uh, Dr. Wong, about the, uh, the ways we've changed, where we put the implants, what we do to make the, it look better and to cause less pain and just make it a much easier recuperation? Sure, but I have to interrupt and kind of back up a little bit when we're talking about nipple sparing mastectomy. So everyone loves the idea of keeping their nipples, but you know, I think of the breast as having two components, the breast tissue as well as the breast skin. And when you do a mastectomy, you remove the breast tissue, but the skin envelope stays behind. And so not everyone is a candidate for a nipple sparing mastectomy based on where their nipple is located on their skin. Uh, Correct. There, if, if you're if you have a lot of breast skin and a small amount of breast tissue, i.e. meaning that you're very droopy, then you either have to have a breast lift to position your nipple and reduce the amount of breast skin prior to mastectomy, or you have to take the nipple at the time of mastectomy and create a new one at that time. Um, I think that there are techniques being developed, different people do different things, but I don't want everyone to think that automatically saving the nipple is a possibility in every situation. Now, moving on to implant-based reconstruction, when I was in fellowship, we placed all of the, everything was a two-stage operation where we placed tissue expanders, where, which are permanent, which are temporary implants underneath the muscle at the time of the mastectomy. Then the patients went through a process of stretching this muscle and the expander underneath until they were the size that they wanted. And then they had a second surgery in order to replace the tissue expander for a permanent implant. And I did that probably for the the first 10, easily 10 years of practice. More recently, um, well, actually prior to that, when, when, um, when you and I started working together, we started doing direct to implant on some patients because if they were good candidates, meaning that they were healthy, their breasts weren't too large, you know, we were able to put implants in and save them the step of putting a tissue expander in and stretching the skin. The reason for that is uh, because of the advent of what's called alloderm or any acellular dermal matrix. What that is, is, is that it's dermis, that it's cadaveric dermis that has allowed us to basically augment the muscle without stretching it. So the muscle, instead of stretching it out to make it large enough to accommodate an implant, basically gets a extra piece sewn to it to accommodate an implant. And so that allowed us to put an implant in at the time of the mastectomy. Now we probably did that in some of the patients, not all of them, but in, in the patients that we could, we tr always tried to. The most recent thing we've been doing for the past few years was really putting the implant or the expander on top of the muscle. And that is also because alloderm or an acellular dermal matrix has allowed us to basically, instead of using muscle and augmenting it, just use it in place of the muscle. And that not, that, act of not taking the muscle and stretching it has really helped patients tremendously because now you're leaving the muscle in an anatomic position. You're not stretching it, which is much far less painful. And then 
patients don't have what's called muscle animation deformity where when they flex their muscle, the implant twitches. In fact, there's actually a number of patients who are now choosing to have their implants removed from a subpectoral or submuscular position and revising the reconstruction to put them on top of the muscle because this has bothered them for so long. I can understand that because, you know, there's that commercial with Terry Crews when he does that and you can, <laughs> you can see that and that's most unattractive. So, but I mean, <laughs> you know, thank, thank God we had, um, we had the muscle to put over it initially going on, you know, from muscle covering the implant so that we have enough, uh, coverage going to the, uh, dermal matrix and now putting it on top of the muscle is just, it's just, um, just so much, so much advancement in this field, really. Absolutely. And I think that what's helped me because I've been in practice for so long and I've actually done all of these things is I have photos to show patients the difference between on top of the muscle versus on versus underneath the muscle. And I also have patients photos that I can show other patients when they come in of what the difference is between going directly to implant versus a tissue expander and then the second surgery to an implant because everyone wants one and done and perfect, but not everyone is a candidate for one and done and perfect. And we have to have a discussion versus what is your priority? And the benefit of having done this for so long is I have a whole selection of different options and other examples to show patients of like, this is of someone who looks similar to you and this is what you can expect. And I think that that is a huge benefit for patients to be able to see. And I even tell patients, you don't have to have reconstruction. I have patients and I have patient photos of other patients who've had no reconstruction so they get an idea of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Now that's great. And I think that the, the patients looking at the before and after pictures is, uh, you know, is just, is really important to them so that they can decide, do they want to have a reconstruction at all? Or what type of reconstruction would, as you know, under your guidance would be best for them. It's interesting that patients have kind of gone in the direction, not all patients, obviously, but a number of patients have gone in the direction of just staying flat. And they, um, and so they know all about dog ears and we don't want to have dog ears and can you make sure I don't have dog ears they ask me um so I think the patients have just gotten so much more educated about this too from 35 years ago because you know 35 years ago is just we just thought about uh we were just saving people's lives which of course we still are but we uh didn't worry so much about the long-term effects of what, you know, the reconstruction, um, the, um, we didn't, we didn't worry about it quite as much. It's kind of like with, kind of like with chemotherapy, we, when we did, we used to just do the chemotherapy and not worry, not, not, not worry, but, but say, well, they're going to have some peripheral neuropathy. They're going to have other problems, but, but they're, they're alive. And now we were, now we are so interested in patients' quality of life as well. And so the, having the best reconstruction really, I think, improves their quality of life quite a bit. And I think nipple sparing mastectomy for people that can do that, it has been a huge boon as well. And I I think some of the patients who are choosing to go flat are because of everything in the news about implants these days. I do have to say that implants aren't without their downsides because implants aren't meant to last forever. Uh, anyone, any surgeon who tells a patient that the implant is going to last forever just is not, well, it's sort of lying because we don't know. They, there is a rate of rupture of the implants and then there's a rate of revision where a patient needs to go in and have the implant taken out and replaced either because of size, because of asymmetry, because of scarring, things like that. So implants have their own maintenance. And so, you know, I think that it's important for patients going in to talk about reconstruction to understand that. And I always tell patients they're not tires. You don't have to switch them out every 10 years, but at the same time, they're not going to last forever. And I see a number of patients for whom implants may be a great choice at this point, but they later on in their lives, they may choose to do autologous tissue or use their own tissues because sometimes, especially with the patients who are prophylactic mastectomies, they're too thin. They have, or they haven't had children and have to have a excess tissue in the lower abdomen to use for breast reconstruction. And I tell them, you know, 
having a prophylactic mastectomy right now, we can do implants, but maybe when this implant is not, is ready to be exchanged, you know, 15, 20 years down the road, you may be in a different place in life. You may be perimenopausal. You may have had children. You may have the tissue there in order to choose autologous reconstruction. So your choice right now is not your choice forever. And because of federal law, insurances cover breast reconstruction always. They don't cover it one time. They will always cover reconstruction. Oh, that's good to hear. I mean, I, I thought that they did, but it's good to have you reinforce that. I think that the, 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 one of the things I like the best about you when I send patients to you is that you are totally honest with them. You know, uh, there's no smoke screen or anything like that. No smoke and mirrors. It's just, you know, you just tell them exactly the bottom line. And, uh, and I think that's, that's really important for patients to hear, you know, to say, oh yeah, we can do this. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be just like a, you know, a, an augmentation. It's not necessarily going to be just like that. I mean, that's the best cosmetic result we can get, but, you know, and, and they may need to, to revisit the whole situation, as you said, after they have children. So I think that um, that's one of the things that I've just always appreciated about you interacting with the patients and explaining to them. The funny story about us working together is that when I started, I was looking much younger than I currently do in my perimenopausal state. And for everyone else listening out there, so Dr. Magnet used to tell all the patients that I, they, she used to tell me that she used to tell, have to tell patients that I was old enough to do their surgery because I looked so young. And consequently, you know, as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little bit gray at the temples. And most recently she said, you should dye that. <laughs> well, she said to her, I thought it gave me gravitas because you used to say I looked too young and now I look old enough to do their surgery and that I have experience. And so that she actually said to me, no, no, you should die that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just as you're very honest with the patients, I want to be very honest with you. You know, you are a plastic surgeon. You do see cosmetic patients too. So I just want to make sure that, you know, that you're, you're, you're looking your best always. Um, it's funny because I remember when I first started in practice, when I was 30, uh, one of the older, uh, surgeons in the group where I went into private practice for the first three years, uh, he said to me, I said, I was upset that patients wouldn't let me operate on them because I, I look too young. And then he said, Oh, Colette, someday you're going to love that. And I, I get that, you know, because nobody ever asked me that anymore. Now I just put out my hand and say, see steady. <laughs> but the thing is, is that, you know, I'm very excited about bringing our, our practices and our practice and our patients to Montgomery Oncology Hematology. I think we've, you and I have worked over the years to kind of streamline our, our practices together in, in that when we operate on patients, we try to, since we, we, we like each other and we don't mind operating at the same time in the same room, that I can finish the mastectomy on one side and you can start that reconstruction while I do the mastectomy on the other side, which is, has really been nice because it, it lowers the amount of time the patient's under anesthesia. You know, it helps us kind of move along in the operating room, not that we rush because we don't but we don't want to mess around. We want to just get our work done. And so just, you know, and, and the other thing that you've been very interested in is not just the efficiency of, you know, the, the workflow, but the other thing is, is not spending too much money in terms of using a million different uh, things in the OR that we don't need. For example, when we started, you, we would do that wise pattern skin reduction for patients with a lot of extra skin, and we still do it. And, uh, and you would actually use the skin to re, uh, instead of, instead of alloderm, instead of a dermal matrix to cover the implant, which I thought was super cool. Uh, it's not only is it the patient's tissue, but the other thing is, is that uh, the dermal matrix, the matrix, the sheets cost like $8,000, $10,000 or whatever it is. And you were actually saving the cost of medical care, which I, I thought was incredibly interesting and good. 
And for just to describe this, so what was happening was patients who could really benefit from a reduction or a lift would have extra skin envelope, the skin envelope that I was talking about at the beginning of this podcast. And instead of cutting away at that extra skin because there was too much of it, I preserved it. And then we also were able to mark the uh, scar pattern for the mastectomy more like a lift or a breast reduction. So then the instead of using the dermal matrix, which is very costly and sometimes there are shortages, um, I was able to use the patient's own skin. The benefit of that is definitely the cost of care as well as it's, it's skin that has a blood supply versus cadaveric skin. And then the other benefit for patients that is exceptional, I think, is actually that they have what a scar pattern on their mastectomy that looks like a breast lift or a breast reduction. So that at the end of the day, once they have nipple reconstruction or tattooing, they have an appearance of a breast reduction or a breast lift. One of the best compliments I ever got from a patient was that she was you know, five, over five years after her reconstruction. And she didn't even think that she had, she didn't even think of it as having had mastectomies. So she was changing in a locker room in front of other women. And one of her friends said to her, oh, you didn't tell me you had a breast reduction. Mm-hmm. And she said, I didn't, I had a mastectomy. That's great. Oh, and that's, this that's is the, great for the patients. It is. It is. You know, the other thing, the other thing I think it would be interesting uh, and I would like to talk to you about is about our oncoplastic surgery. Uh, so when patients have breast conservation, when they have a lumpectomy, sentinel node biopsy, or just a lumpectomy uh, for patients with ductal carcinoma in situ, when I see them in the office, the way I broach, well, maybe we could look at the silver lining in all of this, but patients with really, really, well, they don't have to be that large, but very large breasts. I say, have you ever thought about having a reduction? And they'll, oftentimes they'll say, oh my God, I would love to have a reduction. I've been thinking about this for years. Then we can do the lumpectomy and do bilateral reductions at the same time in an oncoplastic uh, operation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oncoplastic is great for patients who basically have excess tissue. It doesn't even have to be a lot of excess tissue. What it really refers to is the process of rotating in tissue into the lumpectomy defect. It benefits truly the patients who have, who need a breast reduction, but it also can be used for patients who have a breast lift. Outside of doing breast reconstruction, I actually do a crazy number of breast reduction surgeries. And so I see a lot of patients all the time. I talk to them about what their insurances require in order to cover breast reduction. Most insurance companies have a formula of some sort where they will not cover breast reduction unless I can remove X number of grams. And a number of patients don't meet that. The benefit of an oncoplastic situation is there may be patients who always wanted a reduction, never met insurance criteria, but because of the setting of breast cancer, they actually don't need to meet insurance criteria in the same way that someone who didn't have cancer did. That's not to say all insurances don't do that, but a lot of the insurances will um, allow me to remove less tissue for coverage in a cancer sit- in when it's in combination with a cancer situation because it's, it's, um, it does help the patients because a smaller breast is also going to have less problems with healing going to have less, you know, mm-hmm. less area to radiate mm-hmm. and less potential secondary surgeries down the road for asymmetry. Right. Yeah, no, I think that some of the happiest patients we have are the ones that have had lumpectomy and oncoplastic reduction uh, because it's sort of like their dream come true, really. Um, <laughs> so let me ask you about something else is that the whole thing about the implant safety uh, with, uh, you know, with uh, ALCL, can you just talk about that a bit? Sure. There's two topics that are really in the news these days about implants. The first one is what's called, it's a BIA hyphen ALCL. That stands for Breast Implant Associated. And the ALCL is anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It's a very rare lymphoma that's found in the scar tissue around the implants and has been linked to textured implants. And so it's, you know, the FDA has a site that they update typically about once a year in terms of how many patients there are across the country. If I pull it up right now, it's current as of 331, 2021. And <laughs> because they are they do update this completely. And so I, whenever patients ask about it, I do refer them to the FDA website. Um, 
it isn't a large number of patients. And over the, over the past few years, the texturing has been linked to more aggressive texturing. And this did lead to a recall, a voluntary recall of Allergan's textured devices. Now, a lot of patients who have textured implants out there are saying, well, if you remove my textured implant, remove my textured implants, the unfortunate problem is removing the textured implants has not been shown to reduce the risk of developing this because it's such a rare cancer um, at, at most probably about one in 3000 that it's actually, there's, they don't have the data right now to show that removing the implants reduces the risk. The, it has changed the availability of what's, what the available, the, what implants are out there because the tissue expanders, which always used to be textured in order to be able to stay in the place I put them are now all smooth. And so the implants, the tissue expanders do tend to migrate more than they used to in the past. Um, the implants also that I've been using are all smooth and all smooth implants are round because a teardrop shaped implant in order to keep it in the position where the teardrop, the fullness of the teardrop is at the bottom and then the, the, um, the thinner part is at the top. There's the, without the texture, there's nothing to hold it in place. So I suspect there may be things de being developed in um, R and D at these companies, just because right now I'm limited to smooth tissue expanders that don't stay where I put them without a lot of stitches, which cause patients pain. And the only implants I have are round implants. So I think that I do, I also tell patients that I do think that there's never been some motivation for these companies to do a lot of R and D as much as there is now. So implant, so I think the implants coming up in the future 10, 15 years may be very, very different than what we have available today. That's great, that's great to hear. Yeah, go ahead. The, the other thing that is in the news a lot is what's called BII or breast implant illness. And breast implant illness is a constellation of symptoms that occurs um, that patients who have breast implants believe are caused by their breast implants. These are not specific to breast reconstruction patients. It also includes breast augmentation patients. And it includes both saline and silicone implants. And there's a very, very vocal and large group of women who believe that their implants are causing them a lot of symptoms from everything from brain fog to skin sensitivity to you know, a number of laboratory abnormalities to just even psychological um, depression, things like that. And it's being studied. I mean, some, there are some people who don't believe in it. There are some people who believe in it 100%. But I think that the science right now is kind of in progress. There are a lot of people conducting clinical studies to show is a resolution of symptoms with removal of the implants. And there are patients out there who are having their implants removed because they believe that their autoimmune disease is caused by the implants. And sometimes when, the, when their implants are removed and their symptoms don't get better, some people actually do choose to re-implant. And, but this is an ongoing area of research that has a lot of, um, that has a lot of publicity. And I think that, you know, I, I wouldn't discount it. I don't discount it entirely. I don't know 100% how I feel about it because I haven't read all the literature. And I think it's unfair for me to say that of one versus another without really knowing as much as possible. But I also That's tell true. patients this does exist. So it's right. not that I'm, I'm not aware of it. Sure, of course. So is there anything else you think we should talk about? Do you have any other ideas? Well, I think about when we think about um, the teamwork approach to breast cancer, one of the best things is that, you know, we have worked together for so long that I can anticipate you and you can then anticipate me. And then we can kind of really balance each other. Um, for anyone listening out there who knows both of us, you know, that collects the optimist and I'm the pessimist, but I'm the one who <laughs> plans for every possible thing to go wrong. And, and because I'd rather under promise and over deliver. Colette's a cheerleader. <laughs> she's That's the one who's right. like, she's, she's the one who's positive all the time. But I think that, you know, that really helps kind of, but she knows that about me and I know that about her. And so it helps when we care for patients to know kind of what each other's thinking. Sometimes I see patients and I already know she's thinking oncoplastic or a uh, wise parent to, to save the skin or things like that, because it's just been so long. And the other benefit of working together at the same time in the operating room is I can, we actually, I see kind of what she does. So I can tell patients when, you know, I don't come in when she's done. I come in at the beginning when the patient's going to sleep. We chit chat sometimes while she's doing the mastectomy on the first side. And we work on the, on the um, 
patient at the same time when she's doing when she's doing a mastectomy on the second side when, when patients are doing both sides and I start the reconstruction so she has an idea of what I do as well and then it shortens the operating room time and patients are always surprised that we do this but we like working together and I think it's better for the patient overall to have two surgeons who can anticipate each other as well as work well together. I think that's yeah. it. I think that's that's very important. Sort of like we're sort of the yin and yang uh, of you know with each other, and uh, and I can I can afford to be the cheerleader because I know you're going to be the uh, the worry wart. So it it helps in a way too. And I think that the it, it's so important to make sure that that people work together, just like we work with a, a whole team of medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, breast imagers. The, 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 uh, the relationship between the breast surgeon and the, pla and the plastic reconstructed surgeon is an incredibly important thing. And um, you learn to count on the other person and to know what to expect. And I think that's just so much better for the patients. I totally agree. It definitely agree. is. It definitely is. And I think that I, I saw someone give a speech one time where we were talking about if you try to assemble a team it, the example was using a car. If you try to assemble a car by picking the best tires, the best engine, the best everything, you're not going to have the best car. You right. know, what you need is everything to work yep. together. And I think that patients also in a situation like this really benefit from having a team approach because part of it is that I'm not afraid to say to you something that may be benefit for the patient because, right. Right. You know, and I, and I don't, I'm not afraid of picking up the phone or texting you or right. things like right. that. And because I know you well enough that like, if I disturb you, you'll tell me I'm busy <laughs> or, you know, like, but, but if I were kind of thinking to myself, I can't say that to her because she's my senior person. And I might lose this referral. If I mentioned this to her, then it's actually ends up worse off for the patient. Right. You know, exactly. Exactly. I mean, we're just in it to do the best job for the patient is the bottom line. And, uh, so that's all we have, I believe, unless you want to add anything, Kathy. Oh, I don't think so. I feel, I've, I feel as if I've been talking for the entire time. <laughs> I feel like I've been pinging around and you've been bringing it back together. So that's perfect. <laughs> well, now I'm, now I'm Googling yin and yang. Apparently yin is the negative <laughs> and yang is the positive. So you're the yin so and I'm the yang. Can we get matching <laughs> t-shirts that say that? Well, I'm just going to start calling you Yang. Okay. And I'll call you Yang. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for letting me interview you. Thank you for having me. This has been great. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to our latest episode of Oncology Radio. You can find the broadcast on Spreaker, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can find more information about our physician hosts from Maryland Oncology Hematology at www.marylandoncology.com. Subscribe to our show on Spreaker at www.spreaker.com forward slash user forward slash oncology radio. And remember to follow the guidelines and get your cancer screenings for the best defense against cancer.